Hello valued viewers, I hope you're all doing very well. For today's war game, we've had requested we do a reenactment or a simulation one-to-one -one scale of the chapter, The Dance of the Vampires, from the very well-known book by Tom Clancy, Red Storm Rising. So here it is, one-to-one -one scale, fully set out, and we're going to run it. But before we run the simulation, we need to go over the details. The devil really is in the detail of setting this kind of mission up. So we'll spend 10 to 15 minutes talking talking about the book or the chapter and exactly how we've set it up and any idiosyncrasies that we've had to deal with. Then we'll do some predictions and then we'll go and run the simulation through. In preparation for this, I've had to go and reread the chapter, The Dance of the Vampires, and skim through the book just to get all the information that I needed. I hope I haven't made any mistakes. I may have, but hopefully they will be minimal mistakes. Let's look at the setup. First, basic overview. In the book, obviously, World War III has started. The Soviets have pushed into Europe and have taken Iceland in the North Atlantic. A coalition of French and American vessels are sailing as a very large strike group from America eastbound, and that's where you join us. So welcome to 0615 Zulu time. Everything is set out where they should be according to the chapter. So at coordinates 47 degrees 9 minutes north, 34 degrees 50 minutes west, so in the middle slash north of the Atlantic Ocean, we have the Blue Coalition Carrier Strike Group. They are sailing, as per the chapter, 100 degrees, making 20 knots. From them, which is where our simulation starts at 0615 Zulu, 460 miles on a bearing of 349 degrees is Raid 1, declared at this time by the nearest E2C Hawkeye. Raid 1 consists of 80 Tu-142 Soviet Badger anti-ship bombers, each with two AS-5 Kelt long-range anti-ship decoy missiles. Also, to the south, and of course most of you have read the chapter so you know what happens, we have 70 Tu-22M, so a total of five regiments, I think it says in the book. These are backfires, each with two AS-6 long-range supersonic anti-surface kingfish missiles. They will start here at 0615 and will appear here, critically, at 0634 Zulu, which is the time and the position where Raid 2 is reported by the Southern E2C. That will be 130 miles from the carrier strike group at a bearing of 217. So that's all set up position and timing as per the chapter. Now let's go into the nitty gritty details. I think we'll start with the red. So first, as per the book, at a ranges of five to 700 miles to the north to south through east, we have a semicircle crescent, which is a regiment of Soviet Tu-95 recon bears. You can see him, him, uh, him, and him. These are the guys that got in position and triangulated through radio interception the position of the carrier strike group. They feed the information through to northern and southern attack groups who start their attack at 0615. The first guys to attack are, of course, the Badgers. There are 80 of them. And here's where our first idiosyncrasies begin. We can never model these perfectly. The chances of us having exactly the right variant of aircraft and missile for when this book was said to have happened in 1985 are very slim, but we can get very close. So we do indeed have 80 Badgers at exactly the right time, altitude, and speed direction. They are not Soviet Badgers. Instead, we've had to use slightly modernized Chinese Chinese badges, but for all intents and purposes, they're going to be near enough for today. In the book, they had AS-5 Kelt decoy missiles. We do not have them, unfortunately, but we have something relatively similar. We're using KD-6-3. We have a similar type of missile, and that today, as per the book, are going to be fired in a battery of 160 simultaneous time-on-target decoy missiles. And that was, of course, the ethos of the Soviet attack. These guys from the north deliberately get spotted, turn on their jammers, fire their Celts, which have onboard jammers, which, of course, distract a Tomcat. So that's that, and that's all modelled pretty well. Then from the south, the stealth attack. 
hit. A few minutes behind, 70 Tu-22M backfires. Each in the book had two AS-6 Kingfish missiles. We don't have those typically. What we do have is KH-22 AS-4 kitchens, uh, slightly, I think they were earlier missiles, but they're very similar to the AS-6s, so they will certainly do for today. They will fly and get in the correct position at the correct time of when RAID-2 is reported, which is 0634 Zulu, at which point they will obviously fire their missiles. As per the chapter, the missiles were set to look for the biggest radar cross-section ship to attack, and that is how it's going to be modelled today. After that, they will evac back south of Iceland. Speaking of geography, we do not have the correct piece of the Atlantic here, so I've used actually a piece of the Pacific, but it doesn't really matter for today. And that is the Russian attack, set out one per one as per the book. Next, we have the Americans. I think we'll start in the air. So, as per the book, the defending fighters at 0615 were on station two squadron F-14As. It says in the book they were spread out a diagonal line 300 miles across, and that's how I've got it from there. To there is 300 nautical miles, and I've got all 48 F-14As on station. I've not put in their support aircraft, the Vikings and the Intruders, which were carrying their fuel, because it will tie up game resources, which we dearly need. They are the A model uh, from the book, with the four AIM 54C Phoenixes from the book, a couple of Sidewinders and tanks. And they will spot the threat in real time. They're not scripted. They will just spot the threat and respond. And hopefully they'll do the same thing that happened in the book. They are being supported today by the E2Cs. The book says that at 0615, four E2Cs were in play at quartets. It doesn't say their range, so I guessed there, there, there. And there, each uh, E2C has a detection range for a bomber of about 300 miles. And you can see the northwest one is spotting the raid one and reporting that at 0615. And finally, the all-important carrier strike group. It's very important I model this as closely as possible. As per the book, we've got the correct relative location and bearing and speed. The book says that they were set in a radius ring of 30 nautical miles, so we've got a 60-mile diameter ring here. The constitution of the fleet, as per the chapter, and I've had to skim through the other chapters as well to try and get exactly what was in the fleet, and I've done my best, or if I've made any, any mistakes here. Six carriers. One CV, US Nimitz class, and it was the USS Nimitz. On board her were 24 Tomcats, plus tanker intruders, Vikings, E2C, and auxiliary. Also, there was one US Forestal class CV, that was Saratoga, of course, with 24 Tomcat A's, intruders, Vikings, E2Cs, and others. There was also the French CV, the Foch, which on board her were Super E's and Crusaders, plus support. In the center, according to the chapter, were three US Marine Corps L8 loaded with material and troops who were going to take Iceland. Escort, which is actually the most important thing today, is critical that we get the escort ships correctly modelled or as closely as we can because that is what the heart of this chapter was about. How effective would pre-VLS US escort ships be against an attack of this size? So my understanding is the escorts of which they had nine cruisers and six ASW frigates and destroyers are two nuclear-powered Virginia-class cruisers, critically armed with two Mark 26 SM2-equipped twin launchers. Take note of the launchers today, it's very critical we get that right. Two older US California-class nuclear cruisers each have two Mark 13 single-arm SN2-equipped launchers. The brand new ship, the five US Ticonderogas, spelt wrong I've just realised. Note these are the early models, pre-VLS. Ships with such a long service history obviously are modernised every few years and these are the first five that were laid down and built. They are non-nuclear cruisers and each had two Mark 26 SM-equipped twin launchers. ASW, three US Oliver Hazard Perry frigates, each with one Mark 13 single arm launcher, and three, I'm pretty sure, Spruance early model destroyers, each with one Mark 13 arm launcher. Also, auxiliary ships, 10, uh, and I've got them here, but they won't play much part. We now have to look at the idiosyncrasies and do the best simulation we can. 
We do not have Virginia. We do not have California. We do not have Spruance. We do have Ticonderoga and we do have Oliver Has a Perry. Oliver Has a Perry is the exact mark that we've got here, but the Ticonderoga is the incorrect mark. We do not have the 1980s version. We have the early 1990s version with twin VLS sets, which is a very different beast from the early model. So we've got to do some calculations at this point. At this point, I take you down to the bottom. I had to measure the firepower of the SM2 launching devices. A Mark 26 twin arm launcher, according to Wiki and other information, says that including a one second salvo delay per twin launcher, they should be able to service one SM2 for every five seconds. A Mark 13 should be able to service one SM2 every eight seconds. And finally, the Mark 41 VLS system I've measured in the DCS simulator at 1 SM2 for every 2.5 seconds. From there, we can make some calculations. The two Virginias and the five Ticonderogas, I've converted to seven Ticonderogas with the Mark 41 VLS. This will give us exactly the same amount of SM2s in the air as per the five 1980s Ticonderoga and two Virginia class. For the two California, the three OHP and the three Spruance, I've converted to 10 OHP. So that will be 10 total Mark 13 single arm launchers, which will give us the same amount of SM2s as those ships. So although I'm using the wrong type of cruiser here, what I've got at the end of it is exactly the same amount of firepower as per the book fleet could give. Right, let's have a little look at the Constitution. Now, it doesn't really say in the chapter how they were spread. Well, it does a bit, but not much. What it said is the LHAs of the US MC were in the middle, middle so there we go we've got the LHAs next out apparently were the carriers but I don't know where so I've just put them the next out we've got the uh, Forestal so that's Saratoga we've got the Nimitz here supercarrier and we've got the French folk here we don't have it in game so I've used the closest I could find which is an old 1950s uh, Colossus class carrier the next ring, I saw fit to use the cruisers. So I've got the uh, Tycos with the Mark 41s. The next ring, I've put the auxiliary ships, which are just generic auxiliary ships I'm using for today. And finally, I'm having ASW slash FFGs and the outer ring, which will today all be OHP. And that is my fleet. Finally, if you remember the aft end of the chapter once the tomcats have been duped and they will of course be duped today if everything works all that was remaining was one squadron of french f8 crusaders which operated from the folk and we've got them here we do not have the crusaders in game and anything like them but we do have another mark ii capable naval fighter from the period the f4b with uh, same or similar missiles so standing in for the f8 crusaders are the f4s now they will not spawn in until 0634, which is where, of course, Raid 2 was spotted. Finally, I've got my humans. My humans will start in Tomcats here, slightly four of the AI-controlled Tomcats. Don't worry, it will give the same amount of total Tomcats. Uh, today, I've got Matrix Poosh, Simba, Fred, Squirrel, Strider. Say hello, boys. Hello, hello there. Hello, boys. Hello, boys. They will follow the roleplay and they will go and do the attack. Once the decoy attack has happened at 0634, I will allow them to respawn in the Crusaders down here and they will, of course, do the second half and attack the backfires. That is a one to one scale of the chapter. It's the best I can do. Like I said, there are some small idiosyncrasies, but I'm pretty sure it's going to work out pretty much the same, which leads us on to predictions. I haven't, I've had such a rush day today. I haven't actually run it through. I've checked some bits and bobs work and they should work, but I don't really know if it's going to work out as per the chapter and in fact i have some massive problems with the chapter of course the chapter is about the uh, decoy badges here taking the f14a's and then not realizing that the backfires are attacking until they're 130 miles from the southwest of the carry group personally i don't think that's possible they had an e2 to the southwest as per the book which can see a bomber including a backfire at around 300 miles the backfires would not have been at low altitude because they would not have had the fuel endurance at that point so to be honest the backfires would have been seen about 300 miles out giving them plenty of time to set up for the backfires but let me know your thoughts on that for those that have read the book in my chat at the moment do you think it's 
it's going to go as per the book, or do you think you can do anything to stop the bombers? Depends on how you scripted it, but yes, I think it'll be the outcome will be the same as in the book. I've absolutely no doubt. It's such a big attack. I'm not sure you had enough planes to stop it anyway. Really? So stand by. Welcome into the simulation. Just in case you did skip the briefing, viewers, I'm just going to give you a 30 second overview. Here is the French US carrier strike group. Here are 48 Tomcat A's. Here are E 2 D. There, there, and there should be E 2 C's, but near enough. Here are the recon regiment of bears to the north, south, through east. Here is the decoy badger attack at 460 nautical miles. And here is the backfire group, which will show themselves at 0634. My humans today in Tomcats, first of all, are Simba, Strider, Squirrel, and Matrix. Guys, please unpause the server and let's see if what happened in the book happens today. And we're off. Uh, viewers, before missiles get fired, I'm going to show you as much as I can, as quickly as I can. First, we have the combined carrier strike group, uh, which is massive. One thing I didn't realise is how spread out they would be. So spread out. Which I don't get, because I think that jeopardises their mutual support. But let me know what you think. We've got the Tomcats, which are just seeing the bandits now, and uh, heading for them. In terms of loadout, I forgot to show, but they are equipped with the AIM 54s and the Sidewanders, as per the book. Uh, 48 of them. We've got the E2 Hawkeyes, which are, of course, detecting Raid 1 as we speak. We've got Raid 1 up there. We'll go back there. Uh, we've got the backfires getting into position, looking extremely cool. Uh, is... Wow, that just looks amazing. Uh, there were four regiments of backfires, five regiments of uh badges as i remember from the book i've just got to look at that again viewers it's just too sexy i'm afraid You could watch that all day. Let's go and have a look at the decoy attack. Oh, quick. Going as quick as I can. Here we have the, in this case, Chinese badges. Uh, almost identical uh, to the performance of the Soviet badges kinematically with the two missiles. As close as we can get. Ah, wow, look at that for timing. Missiles away. So the these are old Celts viewers. These were very old missiles. And what they did, these are not Celts in game, but they're the nearest we can get, is they... Um, they removed the warheads. They removed the warheads. They filled them full of extra fuel to make them long-range, super long-range decoys. This was what the Soviet doctrine was all about from the chapter. And they fired these from 460 miles away, viewers. Very, wow, look at that. That's pretty much what it would look like, apart from the uh, Soviet symbol instead of the... Um Chinese symbol, uh, 160 of those are going to be fired. Now, here's a really interesting idiosyncrasy from the book. From the book, it said they fired them and then carried on following them for many miles, like many tens of miles. Now, I don't know why that is. Did the old Celts need guiding in manually or something? That, I don't know, but they certainly did. Maybe it's to do with the decoy. Uh, at this point, the Badgers put their jammers on and the Celts as well put their jammers on to confuse the signals to the E2C. But yeah, so I've done what they said in the book, which is to follow the missiles in. At this point, there is another idiosyncrasy because DCS. The Tomcats in the book fired their missiles at a range of 140 nautical miles, which is what they could do in real life with the Phoenix. In-game, they won't do that. Uh, the maximum I can get AI to fire the missiles at is 70 nautical miles in-game, so they will do 70, and that will create an inaccuracy from the book, but there you go. Um, famously, of course, they targeted the Celts. They thought they were the Badgers uh, and wasted all of their missiles on the Celts and all of their fuel getting up to the Celts. The fuel is all modelled pretty much perfectly accurately today so we will see what the Tomcats would have burnt as per the book. They were pretty much topped off from the Vikings and the intruders at this point. Of course in 1985 Tomcat uh, being the premier fleet defence doing exactly what they were supposed to do. There was only 24 of them uh, in the whole coalition, according to the book, and I would have thought, no, sorry, 48, I would have thought there would have been more than that, but let me know what your thoughts on that. Obviously, Mr. Clancy knows more than me about this kind of thing. Very powerful fighters. They'll go at the maximum speed at their optimal altitude, which will probably be about Mach 1.6. 1.7 fully loaded like this um sneaking around the back again as per the book is the kind of sneaky attack force like i said i'm pretty sure they would have been detected in real life but where were they
they coming from? Uh, you can see my screen push. Iceland is kind of up here by 1,300 miles. They all came from Murmansk. Uh, in the Kola Peninsula. They flew all the way around Scandinavia, around the north. They refueled around Iceland. Then these guys here uh, went west, kind of where my mouse is going, then went directly south to attack from the north. The backfires, as far as I can figure out from the book, I think they went all the way around the west of the attack, which I'm skeptical they actually have the fuel to do this, uh, and then around, attack from here, and then attack from the south in the classic pincer. Whereas the Bear Regiment, as far as I can tell, just was spread all over the northeast of the Atlantic uh, in this giant crescent slowly closing in. So my understanding is that how it that is how it worked. I've got the backfires flying faster than they would do in real life viewers, and that's because I need them to make up the time just for uh, kind of scripting and role player reasons. Just a one-way trip for the backfires, I think. I don't think they're getting back. Uh, well, that's the interesting thing. The badgers are expendable in the book. They go in and they know they're probably going to be shot down or at least shot at. And that's because they're subsonic bombers. Even in 1988, these are extremely old designs with an old doctrine. The Tu-22M is actually a fairly new design. Uh, we've got an M3 in game here. It's, it's near enough identical to an M. Now, the thing about them is they're Mark II capable, pretty much. They are designed to do exactly this. Get in, fire their missiles from maximum range, and then go Mark II and burn out of danger. They are designed to be survivable against Tomcats. And there's a good chance they may actually survive due to that. We'll have to see. That said, nothing is perfect and um, they would have had fuel issues in real life. Uh, right, anyway, update viewers. Remember, everything is set at one to one scale here. So, and everything is modeled well in the sim. Speeds, uh, outage used, fuel burn rates, missiles. So it will happen as closely to real life as we can get here. The Tomcats are now from the swarm uh, wow, 118 miles. So in real life, or as per the book, the missiles would actually be, be fired now. Matrix, do you see any of the bombers? They are at 351 magnetic for 174 nautical miles. Negative, nothing on scope. All right, wings back as fast as you can. Everything was doomsday. Um, in the design of these fighters, F-14s were pretty much doomsday fighters designed to go just really fast towards the bombers to get them before they fired their missiles. They might not have even had fuel to come back. I'm not even convinced they would have had fuel to come back on this mission. Like I said before, the Badgers are pretty much doomsday as well. Uh, they're almost certainly going to be shot down by the Tomcats. They've got ECM defensive suites but they will get burned through uh, by the powerful Org 9 radar on the F-14. Also, the lack of situational awareness. A lot of these bombers wouldn't have known where these fighters were. It wouldn't have been a priority for the bears to even tell them about the incoming fighters. Um, it would have been, well, there would, there would have been lots of dynamics at play here. So I wouldn't even be surprised if the badgers would, would be left to get shot down. It's kind of part of their job description at this point. They are 78 miles. We're going to see Phoenix is out very soon from these guys here. And wow, look at that for timing. First Phoenix is out. These are fire and forget, kind of fire and forget weapons. Um, in fact, that's not true at all. They will be guided in by the radar for mid-course updates. And then when they're about 10 miles away from the bombers, their own radars will turn on. And then they will be fire and forget, fully fire and forget weapons. Lots of missiles coming out there. Now, we've used the AIM 54C Mark 60, which I think was available in 1985. A million dollars a missile at the time. Uh, now, if you translate it through with um, interest adjustment, they now cost seven and a half million per missile. It must be one of the most expensive, well, the most expensive air to air missile ever made, presumably. Uh, never used in anger by the US, I don't think. Sorry if I've got that wrong, but used a lot by the Iranians, actually. They've scored like 140 kills. Bogus at 150 miles, identified as Bandit, jamming. Uh, the Mark 60 is just bearing on hypersonic Mark V capable missile. Of course, uh, it's old tech. The only way they could have got these ranges is by going right up really high viewers as they are now and then diving down on top of the bombers. All 48 Tomcats are committed as per the chapter. First missiles are going to start raining down. Yep, they can 100. Oh, viewers. Viewers, viewers, viewers. You can see the five regiments of badgers there. What formation would the badgers have been in? That I don't know, so it's all guesswork. I I'll think they would be spread out. Maybe, maybe. It depends. I think, Pushy, it depends whether they wanted to be detected or not. If they wanted to be detected, spread out. If they wanted to be less detectable, more in the kind of design that we've got here, but of course none of us know what the doctrine would have been at the time. Check in time, uh, 0625, so the backfires have not been spotted yet, according to the chapter. Right, viewers. Boom.
My God, look at that, viewers. Exactly how it would have looked on the day if it was real, which obviously it wasn't. Thank God. Absolutely beautiful. So the phoenixes aren't going after the Celts? No, in the real, I can't force them to go after the Celts viewers. Hence what I've done is I've despawned the Celt missiles at this point because in the book, the missiles went for the Celts, of course. Now, I can't force AI to fire at missiles. They will never fire at missiles. They're going to fire at the bombers instead. So it's a slight change from the book there. But the overall effect is going to stay the same. Second battery of missiles going in. Interestingly, going for the further ranks. Here's an interesting conundrum for me, viewers. Um, because there's so many Phoenixes being fired from so many different squadrons or flights, how would they have deconflicted their fire? What would stop all of the Tomcats just firing at the first bunch of planes? What systems would they have had you know, there was no linebacker or whatever it's called nowadays that the Raptors are using. What would they have done to deconflict? Probably nothing. Nope, they would have communicated it. Uh, what, intra-flight? So flight to flight? Uh, intra-flight, using the E2D, uh, they would have been broke up into zones just like they were. And they would have been assigned target groups. This is really interesting, viewers. These guys, just ahead of the bombers, are out of fuel. That's it, they're out of fuel, they can't fight anymore. Even if they were being attacked by a MiG, they can't fight. They've got, like, 2,000 pounds of fuel. I'm not even sure they were making it back, and look. Look at those bombers falling out of the sky. Yeah, all, all these AIs have run out of fuel, viewers, and I stress, all fuel burn rate is modelled you know, they, they model it stoichiometrically, so it is all modelled as per it would have been in real life. And it's really interesting how many have run out of fuel. A lot of them never got into firing parameters. Right, my humans are now firing. At this point, viewers, as per the chapter, the F-14s are realising they've been duped. They're realising they're firing at Celts and Badgers that actually, in the book, now are turned around. And look how far away, again, according to the book, uh, so this doesn't match up with the book either. According to the book, I've set the uh, Tomcats out to scale. But look, these guys have only just got past the carrier strike group because they started so far away due to fuel restrictions and whatnot. Uh, it'd be interesting how Clancy set out this battle. He must have had a, a kind of big board and set out everything as realistically as he could. But what he didn't have is a wonderful simulation like this where every drop of fuel and every missile and every bit of aerodynamics is modelled by what we have by those days standard supercomputers which is just a gaming pc nowadays isn't that an interesting thing and real life they use this the tcs to see that their missiles were actually hitting a long range camera glorified camera is all it was uh that they were hitting the missiles and that's how they figured out they're being duped uh right the backfires get spotted in four minutes scripting ai on this scale is not the easiest thing to do uh, if you look on YouTube, there's another DCS that's done this. He's done it a different, very different way, though, and he's had all the same idiosyncrasies that I've had to work with, obviously. He's managed to hit, hide his, but obviously I'm doing it in a complete open scale like this, so I have to declare all of the uh, inaccuracies. Ah, oh, Simba's friggin' merging. You have three more minutes to get as many badges as you can. Kudos for giving us a game or a sim that can model this, something this big. Oh, somebody fired on me. Uh, yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, I would do my best to evade that. Scratch it. You were just in the basket. You're fine. A strider. Look at that, viewers. In real life, if they got jumped like this, they would just scatter. Well, actually, I don't know. Again, I was never a 1985 Soviet, so what would they have done? Splash one. The Phoenix missile are designed for this job to take out bombers. Huge warhead. But also with that, don't think it was an amazing missile. It wasn't. It would have not been very good against fighters if they knew it was coming at them. It wasn't designed for taking down fighters. Ninety minutes before you switch to the Crusaders. Oh, you're doing such a great job. I hear guns going off, guys. They didn't gun them in the book, did they? Mm, they didn't say. They just left it at this point, so... 
didn't say what the follow up was. Bad day to be a badger pilot. I would not want to be a badger pilot right now, viewers. And even if they did turn, they wouldn't have escaped anyway. They, they, they're 500 knot aircraft. Splash two. You have one Splash minute. Three. Well done. You have one minute until you're changing over, guys. Well, the boys made short work of. There was 80 of those when we started out, viewers. 80. There's probably 20 left. So 60 badgers shot down. Well done. Raid destroyed. Right, we're now focusing on south viewers. So what we've got now in a few seconds is the backfires are going to get spotted. Why the afterburner so blue on these aircraft? I believe it's the sulfur content of the fuel of the kerosene. It's just a Russian thing. Crusaders in. Everyone in your F4 Phantoms being Crusaders today with about the same ability. Uh, we've got, according to the book, it was one half squadron. You've got eight AI and four beautiful humans. They were not scrambling, but they were uh, protect. They were all being uh, above the fleet at this time, so it's all pretty realistic, right? You've got minutes to stop those backfires, which, according to the book, were 130 nautical miles out. So you've got not much time to do as much damage as you can. In the book, there were AS6, uh, AS6, AS6 Kingfishers. We've got AS4 Kitchens viewers. I think it was a very similar attack profile of high altitude supersonic so mark one and a half I can't remember something like that now they were interesting because they were actually very high tech at the time in the 80s they were not just dumb missiles they were smart missiles with their own radars and these missiles could actually talk to each other in even in the 1980s how much I don't know but they could and they could divvy up targets and stuff to a certain degree which is of course what well pretty much all saving do doctrine was at the time they built everything round finding ways to destroy American carrier strike groups. Now this is all, like I said, set up to scale. So this is what the Cru Crusaders should have been able to do. Go on, boys. I may have got the loadout wrong. It didn't say in the book what the loadout of the Crusaders was. So I've guessed Sparrows and, and uh, Sidewinder. Sorry if I've got that wrong. But I don't think it's going to make a huge amount of difference. Right, distance of them to strike flute center, 110 miles. They should technically be in range of the kitchens right now. Simba check course 206 magnetic. All my boys, 206 magnetic high altitude fast, obviously. They're 50 nautical miles. Can they get missiles off before the kitchens are fired? Are the kitchens even going to work? I've got mm. bandits. Uh oh. That is exactly how it looked in the book, guys. It was meant to look. The high kinematic missiles viewers, and they will just go straight up. Well, not straight up, you know what I mean. They're jamming. They are. T22M had a very powerful jammer on it, of course. Oh my god, look at that. Oh, Winchester. Oh, the boys, they were 45 miles away. Oh, oh well, go and shoot down as many as you can, RTB and guys. Now we have the problem of break 140. Again, as per the chapter, uh, AS6 is coming in. Here's the most important thing of today, viewers. If you listen to the briefing, I've compensated as best I can. There should be the right amount of missiles being fired, and here they come, the SM2, standard missile 2, which they had in the day. Can fire at about 100-ish miles against a target like that, and off they go at about 100 miles. How many will they be able to shoot down? How close? Again, Fancy had no way of modelling this. These missiles are all modelled aerodynamically to real life, fusing to real life, warheads to real life, frag patterns to real life. How good were his predictions about how 140 missiles will get through? Well, we're about to find out for the first time in history, viewers, since 1985. Look at that. If you can see on the YouTube compression... Oh, they're diving. Here they go. Here they go, viewers. Now, where is the carrier group? Oh, here come the, fir uh, here come the first things. First missiles getting hit, viewers. In the book, I think about 40 missiles get through. 40. How many are going to get through? As simulated. Pretty dang well. That I don't know. I guess I can switch between the ship and here. And the ships are so spread out, there's not a great deal to look at, viewers, to be honest. It might be best to look from the missiles. Again, why were the ships so spread out in the book, viewers? 60 mile diameter. Where's the mutual support? Where's the seaward support? Let me know your thoughts. If you look closely, you can start seeing steam, steam trails. Oh, not steam trails. Uh, oil trails, and you see the ships. I've got no idea of knowing how many are getting through viewers. Yes, I can. I can sort of cheat like this. 
How many have got... Yep, just like the book. They should be seeking the largest targets, the largest radar cross-section, which is going to be the supercarriers. And they're going to do it. Just like the book, viewers. See what's going up. Oh, my God. Lots more have got through than in the book. Oh, the sends are shivered, and he's by this 5,000 souls have pulled that thing, and it's just gone up! It's just gone up! Oh, what's going to happen here? Oh, God, someone else went down. Another carrier went down, and, and somebody else is going down here. The Forestal, that's the Forestal's gone down too. Just like in the book! Smash! And there we have it, viewers. One thing's for sure, more, about 40 got through in the book. I would say about 80 got through here. Again, SM25 rates were pretty much identical to how it would have been on the day. Wowee. So it looks like either this is slightly undermodeled or maybe Clancy slightly overmodeled. We have this carrier, uh, Nimitz. No, is that Tycon? No, that's Saratoga. Saratoga is dead and sinking. Nimitz is dead and sinking. And something else got hit, but I don't know what it was. That's a Colossus class, the Colossus class. All CVs are dead. Colossus class is dead, Nimitz is dead, Saratoga is dead. We're essentially taking that out of action. Boom. Down they go. Wowee. One thing left to do. As I call it, Rowenge. Rowenge engage, boys. Go. Really well scripted, that cap. It wasn't it good. Wasn't it good, guys? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This time it worked. Now look, they've got their burners on, then they're flying back as fast as they can, viewers, but they can't go as fast as an F4. That's real friggin' angry. They're doing everything they can to dodge. Missiles going out. Right in the chuff. Well duped with a chaff cloud. You not so much. Yeah, you did as well. No, you didn't. Look at that, Viewington Wilmington's. Giant World War Three air battle. Whole bunch getting shot down, but most it looks like are going to escape. Of course, most of them did, or all of them, I think, escaped in the book. So it shows the uh, potency of the Mark. Well, they're not quite Mark II, but they're they're high Mark bombers designed for exactly this hit and run. Wow, and even model realistic is the terrible efficacy efficacy of the Sparrow, or maybe not. Big seventy pound warhead probably take a bomber down pretty easily. Reports will be coming through of the uh, BDA back to HQ in Moscow. So what do you think the response would be to this? I don't know. What do you do at this point? Plus, they're engaged in a massive in the book land battle as well. Well, that would... Viewers, you let us know what the response would be at this time. You'd have to be, what's that um, film with the B-52s dropping the nukes? Yeah. By, by dawn's early light, is it? Right, yeah, so... Um, just like the B-52s are getting scrambled and off they go. The British, the British would be sending a Vulcan. No, we didn't. Our Vulcans were gone by 1985. Matrix, what Tornado. do we have in 90... Did we didn't have any strategic bombers in 1985, did we? No, Tornado probably be your best. Oh, with Tornadoes, did we? Right. They, could, they were nuclear capable, weren't they? Yeah, most of them got away, but look, you've tangled a whole bunch up. Smash. Kinetic hits from missiles, even against big bombers. So there's so much energy in an impact like that, viewers, that the bomber just tends to rip itself apart, even if it's not physically destroyed by the frag cloud. Huge what year energy was this play. again, Cap? I believe in 1985. Book released in 1986, and I believe this was a 1985 strike. So was that Reagan or Bush in power at the time? Is it Reagan still? I'm presuming it was still Reagan, viewers, correct me. Look at that fighter. Look at that fighter just smashing through and... Remember, these are Mark II, like I said, viewers, but it takes a long time to get a 40 ton or whatever it is bomber up to Mark II. Whereas the F4 Phantoms can also do above Mark II, but they, they're little fighters, they'll just zoom right up to Mark II. So that's how they caught them up. I don't know if Reagan would have hit the big red button. Wow. Well, I'm not sure. Who knows? Reagan had a very strict policy when it came to engaging targets. Strider's just chewing them up. Can I have a uh, double points for the... Um one that I flew in formation with and then just nicely drifted into it. I would, uh, I will give you those points. Yeah, I wonder if they'd ever do that in real life. There were plenty of headbutts in real life around I around Iceland. Plenty of F4s, plenty of Tomcats, intercepted recon bears, but I don't think anyone ever made actual contact. That's it. Done, viewers. As per best I can match the book, 
and probably the best we'll ever be able to match the book in DCS and it pretty much went down as per the book. There was more damage done to the carrier strike group in this sim than there was in the book. So let me know your thoughts on that. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Any uh, comments or thoughts from my pilots? All their 14s are out of fuel. Every single one is out of fuel. Sorry, go ahead, pilots. Uh, no, like I said, just uh, big kudos to you. That was really well scripted, really nice to watch. Viewers, I hope you enjoyed that and bye-bye.